there could be situations where you need those walls quite literally to move. Nowadays, we think differently, right? We think that by removing obstacles and giving people more choices, we make them freer. When in point of fact, um, we don't strengthen their wills necessarily. When we give people too many ways out of situations or, or too many options, uh, we undermine uh, their power of choice. A Christian way of embracing freedom is precisely by embracing obstacles. All right, it's, it's been a while since I did that, so I hope I can manage. Hi, everyone. My guest today is Dr. Javier Carreño, Franciscan University of Steubenville, a philosopher. Again, on this channel, welcome, Javier. Thank you, Cuba, for having me. And today, we are, we are, of course, late to the party. We'll be talking about Attack on Titan that I made you watch all four seasons of. <laughs> how, did you, <laughs> how did you like it? How did you like the show? Oh, I liked it. And I did not like myself for liking it so much. It's kind of like, <laughs> You, you love it and you you hate it and you love to hate it and you hate that you love it. Yeah. It was a mystic, mixed experience. Um, why? Because on the one hand, it is it's just an extraordinarily well-crafted um, world and, and, and story. It is it is very well written. It is it is not superficial, it raises deep questions. It has uh, great cliffhangers. Um, like it, 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 it unfolds at a very nice pace. It has taken a long time for it to be serialized and then produced. But um, you can tell that the that the writer or the producer of this show uh, loves this world really wants to get into the details of it and, and and so there is a kind of patience that also keeps you keeps you um, patient yourself, right? Because you you appreciate the work on the detail, uh, the suspense level of the story, and and so for all those things, I'm I'm grateful. I think it is a sort of I would call it a, a tour de force, mm -hmm. as the French uh, put it, um, right? basically to show a, a progression from uh, someone who wanted to save humanity, right? Or who starts off his journey as one who wants to save humanity to being the very person who pulls the trigger to destroy humanity, right? So so that is, that is no small undertaking to show and to make very credible for us how someone could uh, completely change his mind about all fundamentals. And and therefore, there are many presuppositions about this world that are just revised over and over. And so that's, that's quite remarkable. Having said that, um, this work of art makes its point at a very visceral level, right? Like you really have to sort of... Um, have a strong stomach, yeah, not not to, I mean, a strong stomach to be able to stomach scenes of people being devoured by giants and by by titans. Um, yeah, the, the the series is 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 very brutally Japanese in the sense that it doesn't it doesn't uh, pull any punches. Um, no, uh, it is also not very Japanese in one sense that I'd say. Um, I think most of what we uh, see in, in anime, although it is quite brutal usually, um, it's common to have a very pacifistic tone, pacifist tone. While I think that what what's, what also gives to the, the guilty pleasure of liking Attack on Titan is that um, the pacifist message is withdrawn, I think, 
until the very end. Mm -hmm. And over the four seasons, I think we, we are met with um, a message of just war, like that we are, we are justified to do this. We, we can do this because we need to set ourselves free so we can fight off those evils that, that are um, approaching us. And I'd say it's really, from, for most of the, of the series, it's really like pro-battle, pro pro-struggle, pro-fighting off whatever is um, in, endangering you. And there, even even one of the and there's like there's there's a lot of there's a lot of even Nazi imagery in all that, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. and and uh, like one of the first questions that I that I have for you before we go to the main topic of our of our talk is like what what do you have to say about the fact that um, it is so. It is such a beloved, it is such a beloved series by a lot of young people, while at the same time being really encouraging for the, for you know, um, struggling and um, giving your heart to the battle. <laughs> even even one of the soundtracks, even one of the openings, the one of the opening songs is called "My War." But from from Japanese in, in Japanese, the original title is actually um, like my battle, my struggle, which is the direct name of a famous book by someone that shouldn't be mentioned here. <laughs> the Voldemort of history. <laughs> That's right. Uh, the the epitome of evil. Okay, yep. So. Like in, in terms of of the current times that that we Face that we have. How do you find the fact that uh, this particular series is so is getting so much traction and is getting so popular? Well, it's a bit troublesome, isn't it? It seems. I mean, it seems so. <laughs> it, it, it could only appeal to a generation that is removed from uh, the horrors of World War Two. And of and of genocide mm -hmm. um, to a degree that they, they they could even flirt with with thinking about this in positive terms. Again, that's that's what is shocking about both uh, Attack on Titan and the audience that has an appetite for Attack on Titan, namely that they 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 can consider a scenario where even genocide could be an admittedly good thing. And and it's, if you are not troubled by that thought, you've got some troubles, right? Um, but what would be the trouble of the, of the Gen Sears or of the, of the, of the younger uh, generations? Um, yeah, that, that's a bit harder to understand. Is it, is it possible that they have uh, become so comfortable with peace and so tired of peace or so bored with peace that, that, that they struggle to find meaning in, in survival. And therefore they are, they are starting to look at the possibility of the opposite of a peaceful coexistence, namely um, advancement by strife. Mm -hmm. it, it seems like, yeah, maybe that's that's a step to 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 answering the question. I mean, it is it is curious that as we speak, there are so many people, young people in the United States, who, for instance, would take a very strong side in the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Uh, in favor of the Palestinian side, but then towards the complete exclusion of of of, of Israel, as if um, the, the the horrors of World War II and of genocide 
uh, and of the extermination of the Jews, the, the Shoah, uh, were nothing but uh, just a bad lesson from history that no longer speaks to them. Mm -hmm. So anyhow, those are my off the top of my mind thoughts on on the matter. It is it, it is a troublesome sign. But what do you think? Well, so I think it 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 is a good start for for our main topic because it, it's it's all connected. Because one of the motivations for apart from boredom that you mentioned, one of the motivations for the struggle and 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 readiness for even atrocities is the motivation to be free for the motivation for freedom. And this is how Aaron, the main character, is presented to us at the very beginning of the whole thing as a as a boy who wants to be free a boy who lives behind three walls <laughs> or mm. at least one at the beginning and strives for freedom and that and this is shown even before the initial attack of titans so before he has the 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 wish to protect someone and i don't think it's it's very fleshed out at any point in the series that that he wants to protect and save someone he's rather more interested in in being free and that's his main motivation now that now we have to face um his ideas about freedom and how he understands what it means to be free and the very initial um, opposition that we see and and that is common in in our thinking is the is the the the, the two opposites of freedom and security freedom and safety so the walls those walls keep them safe in in those in in, in Paradis island but at the same time they are oppressive. They are a means of oppression because they they don't let them be free. I mean, technically, it's the Titans that are outside that don't let them be free, but but it is the wall that um, separates them from the from the outside world. And I think I think it it is visible in Attack on Titan that that this pair of opposites is act, may actually be sometimes a false pair of opposites. In right, way, because the, the, there is the, the, the safety comes at, a, at the price of ignorance, right? So there's a kind of mental uh, slavery or handicap uh, that is uh, supposed to, 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 to secure the the Eldians in their in in their island. So yeah, it, it it's and it's a complicated metaphor too. The the, the walls because uh, when we see what happens when those walls are gone, it's the destruction of of, of everything else outside. It's a, it's a complete triumph of chaos such that. The alternative of being of being limited or enslaved by those walls uh, becomes very attractive, or at least the very point of it uh, seems uh, seems preferable in a way to to what Erlen instead decides, Aaron instead decides to sh to to do with all those freed up titans. So when you when you think of of um, ancient or historical philosophers and Christian philosophy, um, how important is freedom as a things as a thing to strive for for a human being? Okay, so um, <clears throat> good question. So, so what is freedom, and uh, what is the task of freedom? Okay. I will I would I would structure a very simple answer for what could be a rather extensive topic as follows. I I think we can look at four variations on the theme of freedom. 
um, coming from medieval times, especially going on to modern times. Um, and I think that these vari these variations in the theme of freedom can help us maybe better place or understand what what Karen is looking after, or perhaps uh, what what Attack on Titan is is trying to tell us about uh, freedom. Uh, we'll see. So a good place to to start the issue of freedom is is Thomas Aquinas, and particularly in relation to what he ha he has to say about the will. Okay. So very briefly put, uh, in the human being, in the human being soul, we have um, four faculties um, that are decisive for moral action. We have right reason, we have the will, and we have the concupiscible and um, irascible appetites. So we have in us something that seeks to know and contemplate, uh, we have in us something that pursues or desires what is good. And then we have appetites towards what is pleasant or uh, appetites that seek to respond to what is outrageous. And this is, oh. so, sorry to, to, to interrupt, but this is what we could see in all those mindless titans, that they are kind of like a representation of um, people's passions, right? There's like they, they have huge mouth, huge eyes, um, or, or huge limbs. Like uh, each of them has some kind of a is some is is a some kind of a, an animal, but with a with an uncontrolled passion for devouring as well. So yeah, this, yeah. So this is this is what you get when you have a mindless. Uh, when you have just power, because they are powerful, but they are not controlled by any kind of mind, they are slaves to passions. That's right. So they are they are not only gigantic and frightening uh, because of their size, but they are perhaps even more frightening because there is neither uh, reason nor self-consciousness to what they're doing, uh, nor a will. They are um, slaves. But okay, so... Um, for Aquinas, we who have wills, um, well, what is a will? It is also a kind of appetite, but it is an intellectual type of appetite because it apprehends the good or it pursues the good uh, in general and also in particulars, right? So what is what is the, the end goal or the purpose of my action? That's a good, something that I am pursuing, right? So... Uh, the good of of nutrition uh, is is or of eating is nourishment. Um, the good of uh, treatment is health. Uh, the good of learning is uh, knowledge or wisdom, right? Like the good is always something that we desire to attain, and uh, and so for Aquinas, it is through our will that we are uh, geared towards. Uh, certain goals, and in particular, happiness, which stands as the chief goal for nature. So we are, we are people who hunger for happiness, who strive for happiness, and who seek to attain happiness in this world and in the next. So for Aquinas, uh, freedom consists not so much in choosing the end, because for Aquinas, the ends are given to us by nature, especially the chief end of our nature, happiness. So we necessarily will happiness, but we are free in choosing the means to the end, right? Or like the intermediary steps to reaching this end goal, right? So we have the power of choice and we can choose different strategies or ways to attain the end goal, we might even fail at it. Um, we are free to choose the means, but not free to choose the end because we automatically desire happiness. That's all that we should say about Aquinas uh, for now because it creates a, a contrast with another great figure from the scholastic uh, philosophy, namely uh, Blessed John Don Scotus, who wants to take Aquinas to task 
and in a way wants to put him upside down, right? Um, as follows. So for Don's Cotus, while it is true that we are pursuing happiness in general, uh, naturally, uh, we are not enslaved to the desire for happiness or we are not automatically conditioned always to pursue our happiness. Don Scotus believes that actually we have to choose to pursue our own happiness on a higher level. Mm -hmm. So he distinguishes two affections within the will. He says that our will normally has this uh, affection towards the advantageous, affects your commodity. So I, let's say normally, as a matter of course, seek whatever is good to me, but also in the will there is something that he calls the affection for justice, um, affectio justitia, which is my capacity to go beyond my own desire for happiness in pursuing the happiness of another, right? So there are plenty of situations in life such as <clears throat> changing diapers at 4 a.m. that have nothing to do with my own happiness, but everything to do with the happiness of another. And indeed, uh, I might have been so sleep deprived that I would be ready to pay a thousand euros that I don't have uh, to be able to sleep another hour, right? Um, if only it was a possibility, but because I have an affection for justice, I will set aside my desire for happiness at that moment and sacrifice it for the sake of the happiness of another. Okay. So that's that's an interesting twist that, that Don Scotus brings into the game that I'm not automatically geared towards happiness. No, I can even rebel against my own desire for happiness, or I can choose against that desire for happiness. But that's and, uh, also arguable in a way, because you can think of changing the diaper of your six month old, old as a means to achieve happiness in the long run for you, right? So it, it might still be serving your happiness if you mm, set the parameters on a, a little bit more far away, right? So, that could be the, the Aquinas's retort, right? Mm -hmm. But I guess Don Scotus would say, well, you just have to look at your own experience. Really, when you are changing your baby's diapers, are you really thinking about your own happiness? Is that, mm -hmm. is that really what you're choosing under the semblance of not choosing it? That seems arguable. <clears throat> I'm going to give you another example. Uh, Soren Kierkegaard. Soren Kierkegaard, the Danish um, romantic, so post-Hegelian philosopher, existentialist philosopher, he he had um, a love in his life. He was he was indeed betrothed to Regina Olsen, and he really loved this girl. But he also knew that if he went through with the betrothal and if they got married, his own pessimism, uh, nostalgia, or anguish would, would have to conquer over her and also ruin her life. So even though breaking the engagement would make him extraordinarily miserable, he still chose it because um, he thought that in doing so, he, he was giving Regina a chance to be happy. Right, so so in that situation, I choose my own happiness for the sake of the happiness of another. Um, how that unhappy choice ultimately makes me happy? Okay, you could say that it seems more moral than just wanting to ruin another person's life. Okay, good for you, but you're still choosing against your loves, right? So Aquinas would try to understand everything in terms of an economy where. I am uh, geared towards happiness. Of course, I'm also called to do acts of justice when I'm procuring what is good for another. But even then, I am I have like a compass and it is always pointing to happiness or the completion of my nature as its North Pole, right? And I use this compass 
to guide myself morally around the globe, right? I'm not really free to choose happiness. It is this desire for happiness that maps out everything else that I do, yeah? It opens up the horizon for all my moral possibilities. Whereas for Don Scotus, no, it, I, can, I can radically choose against my own happiness uh, for the happiness of another. And there's a reason why I'm bringing this up. I think people who have watched uh, Attack on Titan will, will realize that at some point, um, Aaron Yeager is no longer acting for the sake of his happiness. Um, he's also not necessarily acting for the happiness of the greater number. It is non-utilitarian what he's doing. Uh, no, he's, he's, he's depriving himself of happiness and a, and a vast majority of people of happiness for the sake of the happiness of the fewer. Uh, so it is a scary possibility within the freedom of the will to do that, yeah? To, to choose the unhappiness of the vast majority of people for the sake of the minority. Okay, moving on. Um, the other great um, thinker of freedom that is worth thinking about here is Immanuel Kant. And, and he's a very interesting fellow because in many ways he's dealing with, with a problem that is not quite there yet with Thomas Aquinas, namely the problem of physical determinism, right? It seems that from a scientific mindset, uh, nature is a system of natural causes where every effect emerges from a cause and, and, and these are all regulated by arbitrary natural forces. Uh, so I think it was Isaac Newton who, who said that if you knew the position and velocity of every particle in the universe, you could both uh, deduce every pass uh, position or velocity, and also infer every future position and velocity. So the whole of the universe is actually like a clockwork machine. Yeah, yeah that's it a is. pretty outdated view, but <laughs> in a way, maybe. But you see, there are there are there are still uh, neuroscientists. I mean, they're coming up at the rate of one a year, like two a year, who who come out into the open and write this fantastic articles about the fact that we are not free. And from a scientific perspective, we are not free. I mean, of course, their cases are kind of like juicy, not gonna get into them, but but this idea that we are not free is actually becoming very popular. Yeah. Yeah. So what does Kant do? He says, uh, look, I'm, I'm gonna take it for granted that that this paradigm of the universe as regulated by natural forces is true, right? Um, I'm gonna take it for granted that as an empirical scientist, I cannot observe freedom, right? If I look at uh, Jose throwing uh, a stick to his dog, a bane, right? And, and bane goes and, and fetches it and brings it back to Jose, from a third person perspective, I do not know who's free, right? Mm -hmm. All I see from a scientific perspective is a system of biological, physical forces and conditionings. Right. Okay. So for Kant, I do not so easily discover freedom scientifically, mm -hmm. but I know that I'm free. Why? Because I have moral obligations. And you see, if I was not morally obliged to anything, sorry, if I wasn't free, then there wouldn't be a point to having moral obligations, right? So why should I feel moral commands if I'm not free to follow them or not? It, it seems and, a bit con contradictory in a way, right? To, to have a, be determined by, by your circumstance and then at the same time have moral obligations. Sounds like a world devised by a demiurge of swords that really like hated its creation. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, I try to explain it to my students sometimes as follows. It's like, look, let's suppose that I want to prove to you that I'm free. So 
But if I, if I, if I, if I strip naked and walk into the St. Francis dormitory, butt naked, would you, would you say, oh, there he goes at long last, a free philosopher, a truly free philosopher? And of course, they'll tell me, no, we will all think that you are crazy. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm like, exactly, that's Kant's point. You do not prove either to yourself or to anybody that you are free by breaking laws, but rather you prove that you are free by giving the moral law to yourself and following it. And especially by giving to yourself a moral law that has no foundations in biological nature and following it, right? So uh, why wait for sex until marriage? Uh, why ob observe the, the, the uh, you know, why fast? Why, why observe any, 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 any social uh, law that is not grounded in our biology? The reason is because we have we are free, because we can give to ourselves a law that is not in our nature. We can assume responsibilities. So for Kant, in order to become freer, we have to take on responsibilities. We never become free by dishing those responsibilities to someone else. But before we move on to responsibilities, um, you said about fasting and 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 abstaining from uh, sexual life. So when you think about, um, say, the saints, they, and we should all, but it's the most, it's most prominent in them, they mortified their bodies. So they would abstain from different things and they would even uh, hurt themselves. So that they would become free of, of certain passions, right? Of a certain passion. So could we say that then uh, striving for freedom is a worthy Christian um, thing to do? Yes. I mean, actually, you could you could say that 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 the Christian uh, a Christian way of embracing freedom is precisely by embracing obstacles, mm -hmm. right? By 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 finding meaning in those obstacles, um, right? So let's suppose that you are in an arranged marriage. It's not in our, in your nature to 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 be paired forcefully with another person, but. What if you embrace that responsibility um, for the purification of of yourself, or for the salvation of souls, or as a as a genuine and charitable act of love, the way that 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 God in His holiness could not have loved man in his fallenness because he's so holy, but nevertheless have, has freely chosen to love man and redeem him. Uh, so there, there's an echo of that um, freedom, which consists in embracing obstacles rather than getting rid of them, uh, which I think resonates uh, with something Catholic. Aquinas has, in his life, has an interesting way of, of proving this little point by, by Kant. Um, because when Aquinas was only five years of age, he was sent to to become trained as a, as a monk at the Benedictine Abbey of Monte Cassino. He didn't have a choice in it, per se. His parents thought that this was the best path for this boy who looked already quite bookish and clever, whereas his older brothers were already married or said to be married. So, so Aquinas was never asked whether he had a religious vocation. He was just thrown into one. And, and instead of running away from that religious vocation, right, instead of trying to remove that stumbling block, uh, Aquinas embraced it. And as a result of that, his will became very strong to a point that when he was only, uh, I think in his late teens, he ran into his band of brothers, the, 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 the Dominicans, 
um, he, he decided to join them and his family couldn't convince him otherwise. They couldn't go against uh, his will. He walked away from the Benedictines, joined the Dominicans. He was even put in prison. He was imprisoned in his family home. His brothers uh, tried to uh, even tempt him into lustfulness by locking him up with a, with a prostitute. And, and Aquinas was was so set in his new vocation that um, they had to accept the fact that he was freely choosing against their wishes. But what is the point here? Aquinas's will would not have become as strong had it not been for the fact that he first embraced the obstacles that were given to him, right? So nowadays we think differently, right? We think that by removing obstacles and giving people more choices, we make them freer. When in point of fact, um, we don't strengthen their wills necessarily. When we give people too many ways out of situations or, or too many options, uh, we undermine uh, their power of choice. Yeah, when something becomes too easy, it also becomes impossible. So we, okay. seem to, we seem to be talking about um, two different kinds of freedom noticed by uh, Viktor Frankl, of course, that freedom as an internal disposition towards life in general, and, and the outside freedom, freedom to choose things to do, to move on paths that are open for us, right? Oh, like, say a little bit more. So, you know, the people in the people in Auschwitz weren't free in, in the outside sense of the word, but some of them had this inner disposition that, that that couldn't be taken away no matter what. They could choose to be happy if in, in, in Aquinas sense. And 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 they were. This is what this is what Frankl noticed in the in the camp. That's right. So even though they might not have that many choices, right? They still had an internal freedom because they could, let's say, choose their attitude and, and nothing or no one could take that internal freedom away from them. And what we see in Aaron, it seems that, that he wishes for this for this outside freedom. Like he wishes to be able to do whatever he wants, wherever he wants, and whenever he wants, to have this this kind of variety of choices. Right. When we when when we come to Aaron Yeager, I think <clears throat> I think that he's 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 more 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 Nietzschean. So let me let me say something short about Nietzsche because just as <clears throat> Don Scott seems to be doing something funny with Thomas Aquinas. So also Nietzsche is doing something funny with, with, with Kant. I'll mention a couple of points. So for Kant, you are free to a degree that you uh, give the law to yourself. So you give, you create the law, but you don't place yourself above the law. No, you put yourself under the law and you begin to, to act uh, out of duty. Um, so, so you are a master by way of being humbled. Now for Nietzsche, not everybody has in equal parts the power to create laws or what Nietzsche calls values and the, the ability to submit to those laws or those values. He thinks that these two powers of the soul are actually unequal across the board. So that means that uh, there are some of us who are naturally better at <clears throat> creating laws and will still place ourselves above the laws. Mm -hmm. And there are others who, who, who are not so interested uh, or don't want to busy themselves creating laws or values. They just simply and plainly adopt the ones that already exist for them unquestionably. And so for Nietzsche, on the basis of your will or your willpower, some will be masters and others will be slaves. 
right? So there will be a power differential. And, and also there will be, a, even if you are a master who wants to be a very benevolent master, um, you will have to treat other people differently because you are aware of that difference. So you will only respect others who are masters, um, whereas you will necessarily think of those who don't have this creative willpower as slaves, as natural slaves, and you will have to use them as means to an end. So for, well, if we enter deeper into Nietzsche, we see that he's very interested in this transvaluation of values, this change of values. How is it that that values are subjective <clears throat> and, and, and so they can change across time and their changes depend on, on the strength of the will, right? So um, more could be said about that, but I want to I want to begin to tie this more closely to to Attack on Titan. So I think of Nietzsche when when I when I look at the actions of of Aaron because uh, right at first he he he's born within the walls. He lives within the walls. He wants to transcend the walls. Yeah. He wants to know the world beyond the walls. Um, and, but then outside of the walls are, are these titans who are uh, unfree creatures, right? So, and, 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 and when Aaron sees his mother being um, eaten by a smiling titan, Right, his mind is is made, and he wants to be able to defeat the titans so that people can leave the walls and overcome the walls, <clears throat> and so that humanity has a fighting chance. Because when when the titans, especially these two um, special titans, the armor titan and the colossal titan appear and begin to destroy the walls, it seems that, that the little of humanity that is known at the time comes under threat. So Aaron begins as a, as a champion of um, humanity and as someone who has a, a deep desire for freedom. But then freedom becomes uh, not, I mean, it just goes beyond doing your own duty, right? Um, Aaron discovers that he's freer to the degree that he gains power. He realizes that he has one of the titans in himself. Uh, that turns out to be a game changer for the survival of humanity within these walls. And, and eventually a game changer in the conquering of the titans outside of the walls. Right? So, so Aaron increases in power. Um, he should be feeling a freer, <clears throat> but then well, this is the neat thing about Attack on Titan. What, what Aaron and others begin to realize as their world expands is that not even they are freer for knowing the greater contours of the world, right? The, the, the wall is replaced by the sea, right? by an even greater wall uh, of water. And, and beyond that, they realize that they, they are not uh, loved. No, they are heated, hated, feared. Um, it, it, it just gets worse, right? So, so, so suddenly the, world, the wall is replaced by a whole world that is against them. And, and Aaron begins to think quite clearly that if he's going to defend the piece of humanity that he belongs to, he's going to have to do it over against the rest of the world. And that's that's where the idea of activating the uh, what the, the end of the world Titan uh, uh, emerges, and of course it emerges within 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 the context of of a series of discoveries that, 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 that we could get into. But <clears throat> at the end of the day, Aaron no longer understands his freedom 
as a matter of responsibility, right? He also doesn't understand his freedom as a matter of happiness. No, he he understands freedom as a as a matter of <clears throat> exercising willpower over the rest of humanity like no one has ever done before right so to to be free is to hold the rest of humanity to one's power yeah and that that seems very 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 Nietzschean in many ways yeah uh, so a couple of quotes, <clears throat> he says at some point, I will hold freedom in my hands by taking it from this world. He tells that to, to his friends in one of these um, dreams. But from you, I will take nothing. You are all free. You are all, all free to oppose me at the, and defend the world's freedom. So... Right, the Titans, the other Titans, they they are also like creative spirits or like free spirits. They are free Titans like he is. He chooses not to dominate them, even though technically he could, but now he respects them. Just like in a Nietzschean understanding of freedom, the master respects other masters. Yeah. But but still they he wants to realize this fearful possibility of of experiencing ultimate freedom by depriving everybody else underneath him from from freedom from life yeah so okay no maybe i'm, I'm running too fast with that slow me down if, if okay so so let's let's go to the point in the series which is at the end of the third season i think when they overcome the titans on the island and they reach the shore and then they are met with, as you said, another wall, a wall of, of, of water. Uh, could, could we say that, okay, so you can strive and you should strive for freedom, uh, but you have to give it a measure. Let's say as, as much as you can chew, maybe. So maybe that's... Uh, because this this was the point where where I think Armin told him that okay so that's enough like this is this is how far we should go, and we shouldn't move any further. We gain control over the island and and we we should be fine here, while Aaron has this imperative, as an attacking titan, to move forward. So maybe maybe his actions were good in to up to a point, and then this is as much freedom as you need, but. Freedom is not an absolute value in itself, and and that's it. Or how do you see that? Well, yeah, no, I I I agree. So so you could say that that um, Aaron's Nietzsche plays plays interestingly with with Armin's um, um, Kantian perspective, right? So freedom means to be with, within limitations, yeah, mm -hmm. and to accept those limitations. Um, and to 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 obey or to take on responsibilities to do one's duty, um, but Aaron is is restless, right? In his in his mind, uh, this is not this is not the ultimate freedom. No, there's a greater freedom when when you can uh, place yourself above the law and actually above everything and everyone else, and have as it were this uh, intoxicating moment in which you 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 play God on on the rest of humanity. Now another proposition as a contrast maybe to that would be that freedom is actually an absolute that we should strive for, but it's only achievable in death, which is our death. Which, which would be because mortification gives you freedom you can see that in the in the saints that we mentioned before right mortification so a little death little dying gives you more freedom and maybe you should strive for absolute freedom but this abs you, uh, over time you realize that absolute freedom is only in death because if, if you are still alive you're always bound by your bodily existence for example so maybe it is an absolute to strive for. 
Well, see, but it, but it takes a romantic to do that, right? <laughs> to see to see the fulfillment of life um, come together with the obliteration of life. It's or, a or a Japanese, yeah. Yes, <laughs> either a romantic or a or a Japanese to want to hold those two moments together. Yeah, because you you're right. There there's also the 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 fact that that Aaron doesn't just want to win and be and be cheered by folks at home after having wiped out the rest of humanity. No, he he also wants to choose his own death. He wants to to be killed by no less than the woman he loves, right? And and so, yeah, it's it's, it's very romantic, right? Uh, this idea that uh, well, it is it is in death that um, fullness of power is is extinguished and and love is met and. Um, and and happily I go to hell. <laughs> it it it's it's very you could say it's very twisted. Um I'm not gonna say that it is illogical. There's there's a, there there's a reasoning behind it. But again, you have to be a romantic. So Aaron has a choice. Well, kind of, between having a comfortable a short life together with Mikasa, right? And then going on to change the world dramatically so that the Eldians no longer suffer this curse where the children have to eat their parents. Yeah? Because um, he he made that promise to uh, Historia. So, so he chooses against the, the 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 convenience of life, right? Mm -hmm. The commodities of life. He knows that he was very close to choosing it had Mikasa been more forthcoming about his feelings for him. Yeah, her feelings. So, yeah. so, so I think that the, the the anime focuses a lot on that on that conversation. Could could Eren have made a different choice if Mikasa had declared her love for him? Mm -hmm when he asked her to make her feelings plain. And, and she said, uh, no, I love you as family. Again, this weird Japanese theme of, of sibling love, even though they are not siblings. So, okay, we're, we're not going there. In any event, um, he, he, he chooses against that path, right? The path of domesticity and goes for this, for this more extravagant path. Uh, not only because in his mind, it delays the, the, the war that is going to destroy his race, but also because it, it allows him for this one last encounter with uh, Mikasa, right? And and the scene with which which this part of the of the anime closes is it's even more uh, troublesome than Evangelion's final scene, <laughs> right? Because he gets his head cut off by the woman he loves, and she finally gets to kiss him, right? It's like. Um, Aaron, the monster of freedom, has to be vanquished by someone who is a, a, a titan killer, but nevertheless very much constrained by conventions. Yeah. Um, so, so the romantic conventions dominate the 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 otherwise uh, belligerent uh, conventions of this tale. In a in a in a way that that makes me wonder, right? Mm -hmm. uh, why is it that for Aaron it was easier to destroy the whole of humanity yeah. rather than like just tell tell the girl he loved that he loved her? <laughs> oh, why yeah. is it that he would rather have his kid uh, his head cut off? Yeah, get his first kiss. Like, 
I mean, I kind of like this about Attack on Titan that it doesn't uh, get this romantic uh, plot to the forefront. It's always kind of in the back, but it all, but it can also be explained fully with that plot in a way, as a as a yeah as a main driver behind everything that is going on. Now, um, so. At one point, he, he says that uh, he had become a slave to freedom so that he cannot do anything else but go for freedom and choose freedom. And could we say that, and, and that was a, a, the, the imperative of the attacking titan, that the attacking titan always moves forward and never looks back. Could we say that... Um, and this, this breaks the, the opposition of freedom versus safety, that Aaron actually had more freedom behind the walls than he had after raising the walls, uh, after destroying them. And could we say that there's sometimes there is more freedom in inactivity rather than activity? Is that, a, is that a valid proposition <laughs> for, for for thinking about freedom that that sometimes you may you may be more free when you're inactive and maybe there's value in inactivity rather than activity so the radicality of his activity makes one think that yeah there could be more freedom to to inactivity perhaps mm -hmm. But but of course that only goes so far, right? Is it is it true that uh, the only ones free in a political system are those who don't take any choices or mm -hmm. don't make any choices, take no sides? Is it, is it really the case that those who who delay at making a decision are freer than those who make up their minds and never look back? There there could be. There, there could also be a limit to that. Mm -hmm. um, if there's going to be a freedom of inactivity, it will have to be defined over against the backdrop of the unfreedom of inactivity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, but I take the the point to be something like the following: um, we are not condemned to act. We are not condemned. So sorry, Sartre. Not sorry. We are not. We are not condemned to fulfill the worst possibility that lies within our freedom, right? Like we are not condemned to go nuclear mm -hmm. uh, just because we have that in our arsenal. Yeah. So there's there's. That that could be a way of, of of thinking of freedom. You and again, Aaron comes up with the following idea, right? That actually nobody is free ultimately in in his world. Like not even he. He thinks that he is the one coming closest, but no one is free, right? Uh, free humans are um, are not only uh, the captives of other humans; they are also dominated by unthinking. Titans and even thinking Titans are themselves subject to the founder Titan. And even this founder Titan is not, is not entirely free, uh, Elia, because she is um, dominated by, by uh, the king who, who used her, obviously, for military purposes. And she's faithful to that. Uh, so... So all along, uh, even those who think that they are freer than everybody else are themselves uh, bound by, by greater constraints. But I think that there's something interesting in Attack on Titan because Elia is more interested in Mikasa than she is in Aaron Yeager. Right? Oh, you mean you mean Ymir? Ymir, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. The, the founding, the founding uh, Titan. That's right. He's very interested in this woman, right? It's almost as if 
her choice was more important than than Aaron's. Yeah, that's right. Aaron thinks that that he's absolutely free uh, by choosing to do the unthinkable, uh, whereas whereas uh, Mikasa is the greater hero for choosing against her own heart, right? Um, choosing to sacrifice the one love of her life. Um, and... Especially that also as a as a titan killer, um, as an Ackerman, she she has this supposedly a mental barrier uh, that prohibits her from from killing Erin. Like she has to break something at least symbolically in her within her head to to be able to kill him. Because as the Ackerman, she is designed to protect him, to protect the founding titan. Right. Well, I mean, there, there's that scene too where it appears that that Aaron um, was also lying to her when he mm -hmm. told her that that she couldn't kill him. Mm -hmm. Right. That it's not just that she was she was wired to protect him. But also that she could not kill him, right? And so it, it makes it makes one wonder why he would he would tell that lie to Mikasa. It almost like a noble lie, mm -hmm. sort of like, all right, I'm going to to wake I'm awakening her the possibility of going against the man she loves mm -hmm. uh, by telling her that she cannot do it. Mm -hmm. uh, that she cannot physically do it, that she's conditioned by the world, and therefore she she cannot have this ultimate act of freedom, which is to go against the person she loves. Okay, I'm I'm having shivers going up and down my spine, right? Because these pictures of freedom are just very negative, aren't they? Yeah. So so the male version of freedom in Eren is, is the freedom to dispose of your enemies. Uh, never mind the fact that they are the majority of people in the world. Mm -hmm. Without qualms, seemingly. Um, and, and Mikasa's freedom is, is, is the capacity to, to go against the one she loves. While all along, like to kill the person she loves. While all along acknowledging that 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 she still loves him and is the only person she loves him, and she's gonna love him all her life. Yeah. Not a whole lot of happiness here. Uh, no not redemption. A whole lot of peace either. You know? No redemption. Yeah. Yeah. So so that's a bit of a of a of a sour note. And then in the end, we, we see that even um, when he tried to, to eradicate Titans from the world, it seems that the, that the spine thing, that the worm survived somehow under the tree. People still go to wars and there's still probably an, uh, a chance for, for Titans to be reborn. That's and the post-credit scene, yeah. Even in yeah, the post credit scene is very important there because it shows that even in the absence of Titans, there's warfare and strife, right? Um, even in the absence of, of natural Titans, there are still technological Titans, mm -hmm. right? People will still want to um, impose their will on others, mm -hmm. create and sustain power differentials. Right, so so there's no middle ground. Either uh, there are those who gain power and precisely gain power over others, or uh, you are enslaved to others. There's there's seemingly no third way. There is no 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 happy Kantian submission to the law within yourself. Uh, and the rules. The reins or or freedom in the pursuit of happiness. It's a it's a war on end. Yep, and the roles changed as well. So you, you don't have a simple, you know, Elgin's good, Marley's bad dichotomy, but it it changes with 
as new things get revealed, we see that one sometimes these are oppressors, sometimes the other are the oppressors. So we we are always in the never ending cycle of of just uh, dominating one another whenever we get a chance, right? <laughs> Very gloomy. Very I gloomy. If it's true. I wonder if it's true. Now regarding freedom, I have this one final question that has been bothering me for years now regarding Attack on Titan. How do you understand that you destroy the world, that you attack the whole world with the walls? With walls. Say more. Where is this coming? Yeah, so 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 the, the titans that, that are that do the rumbling across the world that destroy it are the wall titans. They are from the walls, right? Okay. So uh, I'm I'm wondering about the symbolism of that. And is it your limitations that make you that make you um dominate the world? If you didn't have those limitations, you wouldn't be able to dominate the world. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real twist in that, I think, that it gives like a, an extra level to, to the story. But maybe if, if Aaron was God and he didn't have any limitations, he wouldn't have to destroy the world. But because yeah. he has those limitations, he's able to, and he does that. So those limitations that he had at the beginning gave him the freedom to dominate the world. Going back to 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 Don Scotus, he also speaks about God's power elsewhere. He makes a distinction between God's ordinate and, and absolute power. So ordinate power is the the power by which God creates the laws. Yeah, so the eternal law and natural law is a participation in the eternal law. So through his ordinate power, God creates um, the laws that rule the universe. But through his absolute power, he he can he can uh, suspend those laws, mm -hmm. uh, change them. Right. So he can ask of men to do something immoral. Right. Um, so that's the issue of if God can create this, the the rock so heavy that he couldn't lift, right? That's the. Well, I don't. I, don't know. <laughs> uh, that, I mean that one. Yeah. That one is an easy one because uh, why? Because uh, actually, for Don Scotus, uh, God still has to obey um, the laws of logic, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas, so so you cannot ask of God to do something illogical. But God could do something different from what he has ordained, or he could demand something different from what he has ordained um, through morality or the rules that he has uh, instilled in the world. So so that that ambiguity, right? Like God creates the laws and the borders, but but he could also at any time uh, destroy those very, orders uh, not for no good reason for those good there still needs to be a, a good reason to do so but but there's no contradiction uh in god doing so so something analogous happens in in the attack on titan world right and it's curious it's just weird that uh in the religion of of the aliens the walls are worshipped right the walls themselves are deities so they are they are protecting deities, mm -hmm. but they can indeed they 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 are turned into a, a furies. They set the world on 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 fire. They 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 create uh, chaos to to unimaginable scale. So yeah, I w what else do, can be can be said about that idea that your walls are not only your greatest defense, but also 
the greatest potential threat to others? Well, at least I understand the first part well. Your walls help define you, right? Mm -hmm. the, worlds, the, the walls concentrate you. Uh, you want to preserve the walls, even though the walls can be broken. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, if, if, if you are like the person who never leaves the walls, right? You, you never see beyond a tiny parcel of the universe. So the wall that is protecting you can be constraining you, can be too much of a cradle, um, can become too stifling. And, and so there could be situations where you need those walls quite literally to move, right? Um, but do you really need to move them on top of others? Do you really need to trample all others under your walls? Mm -hmm. I guess if you are a weird Aryan Japanese like Aaron Jaeger, I guess the answer is yes. But if you are not, or if you want to think more freely than that, about maybe not. <laughs> I think this is a, a good time to wrap this up. And yeah, follow Aaron, but <laughs> just to an extent. <laughs> Don't be like Aaron. Cut his head. Off with his head. Off oh. with his head. And hope that you can escape the the tragic choice the tragic choices in your life. As Mikasa had one to choose from well what what would jordan peterson say wouldn't i don't, don't know you've got to ask me. him <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't he say something like look you you have to realize that that you are dangerous or you could be dangerous yeah all right that it is a possibility for you to do something disastrous that you are neither so 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 stupid or so powerless that that what you do is inconsequential. No, you 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 could do something terrible. But then you are truly free when, despite knowing that, you choose otherwise, right? You would choose not to impose your will on others, or you would choose even to undergo self-sacrifice rather than 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 commit injustice at a large scale that's right thank you javier thank okay. you okay and until next anime comes to <laughs> comes to our houses <laughs> okay great we'll leave it till next time thank you thank for the invite thank you very much see you bye bye